All right. Um, so welcome everyone to my talk today. Um, uh, today I'll be talking about uh, drone-based quantum TV distribution. And just to give you an idea of, uh, first of all, this is going to be a highly experimental talk. Um, and so just to give you an idea of what is in my presentation, I will first motivate uh, um, the use of drones for quantum key distribution. I will then give you kind of an overview of, uh, our, of our experimental setup, uh, which will lead into talking about the subsystems, which include the transmitter, the receiver, and the pointing and tracking system that we use. And finally, I'll show you some of the data that we've been able to collect so far. Um, so quantum, quantum networks uh, com that, uh, um, that combine uh, you know, mobile uh, platforms are useful for secure communications, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, for uh, distributed quantum sensors, and, to, and they can also link uh, uh, remote quantum computer uh, nodes. Um, and so, you know, with, with, our, with the current, uh, uh, you know, the ongoing work trying to get uh, going for uh, um, the quantum internet, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in, in introducing these mobile systems into quantum networks. And this is a very hard job, very hard thing to do. Uh, and so currently, uh, quantum key distribution has already been demonstrated um, on mo mobile platforms, such as uh, uh, satellite to ground QKD and plane to ground QKD. Uh, but these um, setups, these platforms are very inaccessible. Um, and so this is where drones can kind of get an, an advantage because they can, um, uh, provide low size weight and power applications. Um, you know, currently drones are used anywhere from defense to delivering consumer packages in, in our society. And so drones are very good candidates to, you know, to build upon for these kinds of networks. Um, and so um, first, uh, this is kind of an overview of, of our experimental setup. So we use a polarization based BV84 protocol. Uh, and we use three states um, because it has been shown um, that three states can achieve the same rate as four, uh, the same uh, secure key rate as four states. And so, um, as you can see here, we have, we actually have, um, okay. So we have two drones on the, we have a transmitter drone and a receiver drone. On the transmitter side, uh, the drone is carrying a, our controller, our sources, which are uh, three uh, resonant cavity LEDs and our optical setup, which we use to create our polarization states. On the receiver side, we have another optical setup, which is very similar to the transmitter. Um, but in this case, we use that to uh, you know, project our measurements and to actually uh, uh, um, sort our states. Uh, we then have a four channel single, fo uh, single photon detector, uh, which detects our states. And then we uh, collect and save our data using an FPGA. Uh, now that's on the quantum side. On the other side, we need to be able to, you know, make these drones point at each other because it's a very difficult job. So we also have a pointing and tracking system that I'll go over in the later slides. So the first thing I'll talk about is our sources. Uh, so like I said, we use three uh, resonant cavity LEDs. Uh, we couple the light from these LEDs into a single mode fiber. Um, and then we attenuate the, uh, the light to a single photon level. And then the FPGA powers our LEDs at a rate of 12.5 megahertz. Um, however, LEDs are not perfect sources for single photon, uh, emit, uh, single photon emitters. They can actually, they actually do produce, uh, you know, multi-photon pulses. And this makes us very vulnerable to uh, the uh, photon number splitting attack, which was mentioned in the previous talk. And so to prevent this, we additionally use what's called the uh, decoy state method. And to uh, <clears throat> employ this in our system, we actually use the FPGA. And so what we do is we, um, uh, we connect the LEDs to two separate resistive paths, one for a signal path and another for a decoy path. And we use the FPGA to quickly switch between high impedance and signal or high impedance and decoy to actually create uh, our states. And this actually allows us to have seven different states with only three sources, meaning we have the three signal states, three decoy states, and the vacuum state. Um, and so how do we create our actual polarization states? Well, after the, the light is coupled into um, the LED, uh, we actually couple it to a, to a collimator, which then passes the light through, a, for example, for the right polarization. Um, actually, let me back up a little bit. So we use left, right, and left and right circular polarizations as our signal states, and we use uh, vertical and horizontal polarizations as our monitoring states. That has to do with the decoy state protocol. 
And so, for example, to create our right circular polarization, we couple the light from the LED, it goes through a horizontal polarizer, and it, then it goes through a quarter weight plate creating our right uh, polarizations. As I go through the talk, I will uh, talk uh, in more detail about our, uh, the rest of our setup. Um, so, so far so good, right? We, create, we can create our states and we can just send them to the receiver and we'll be done with this, but it's actually not that easy. Because we have three separate sources, um, three LEDs in this case, we need to, and we are only encoding our information in the polarization of the states, we need to actually make sure that the rest of the modes of the photon, uh, namely the, uh, the spatial uh, mode, uh, the uh, temporal mode, and the spectral modes are all indistinguishable from one another uh, to prevent uh, you know, side channel attacks. And so to do this, the first thing we do is the spatial indistinguishability. And to do this, we achieve this by coupling all three sources into one spatial filter fiber, a single mode fiber. Um, and, you know, however, fibers are known to change, they can change the polarization of, of our states. And so to com compensate for that, we use what we call the compensation weight plates over here, which are essentially two quarter weight plates and a half weight plate. Um, and they compensate for whatever transformation the spatial fiber does to our states. And by uh, using this setup, we're actually able to achieve a 98.75% fidelity of our state. So this is pretty good for us. Um, then for the spectral indistinguishability, what we do is that we carefully curate the LEDs that we use in our system. Um, and this actually yields highly indistinguishable states. So for instance, here in this plot, you see uh, three LEDs that we're using. And these are already 97.3% uh, indistinguishable. And then we farther pass these uh, states through a uh, narrow band filter, or na one nanometer narrowband filter over here, uh, which farther uh, improves our indistinguishability. Now, there are more details about the indistinguishability of states in our system. They'll be presented by my colleague, uh, Roddy Cochran, later on a poster presentation. So I highly recommend you go and look and check that out. Um, and so that, that, does, that uh, guarantees this indistinguishability spectrally. For the temporal setup, but this is actually a little bit more complex. So the way we do this is that we create, uh, you know, pulses that power our LEDs, um, and that pulse then that electrical pulse then creates a, an optical pulse through the LEDs, and at the same time we send a reference signal from the FPGA to a time tiger, and that takes time uh, t. Um, the optical pulse created by the by the LEDs then goes through the regular transmitter setup as we would in any in a regular experiment. Uh, then that gets detected uh, on the single photon detector, and then that signal um, gets sent to the uh, time tiger. It's time tag, that, and that takes this loop right here takes time t prime. And so by taking the difference between you know t prime and t many 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 times, we're able to construct a histogram which corresponds to the temporal profile of our photons. Um, and so <clears throat> the way we guarantee spatial and we achieve a spatial uh, sorry temporal indistinguishability in this case is we use the FPGA, um, we use the FPGA to um, shift uh, our pulses in time and to also control the, the width of the uh, temporal, uh, or sorry, the width of our electrical pulses, which in turn, um, you know, means that we can control both the shift and the width of our optical pulses. And so by using dynamic phase shifts on the FPGA phase lock loops, we're actually able to achieve a 78 picosecond resolution on, the, on, on these temporal profiles, both the width and the shift of our profile. Uh, and do, by doing this, we're actually able to achieve a 97.9% .9 indistinguishability of all six states. And this is the worst indistinguishability that we got. The other ones are better. Typically, signal is, uh, to signal is better. Um, and, and so, yeah, so now that we've guaranteed, you know, the, the, uh, all the distinguishabilities of our system, um, we also need to satisfy another condition for the BB84 protocol. Namely, we need to be able to produce our random pulses for our signals. And to do this, we actually use uh, hybrid Boolean networks. And these Boolean networks are based on X, X or or X nor ring oscillators. And these are essentially chaotic system and they're actually able to produce very high quality uh, random numbers. And so once we create the random numbers uh, using um, the, uh, the, true, the true random number generator, we actually combined that with the previous uh, you know, width and shift control that we had. And by ending those two pulses, we're actually now able to produce random and adjustable pulses that we use to create our signals on the LED. Um, and so 
essentially now I've described everything that goes on in the transmitter side, um, and now we will we'll talk about what goes on on the receiver side. Um, on the receiver side, we have a similar setup to the transmitter. We have a you know a sorting uh, an optical uh, setup that sorts our states. I won't go into too many details, but essentially we sort our states uh, to their respective bases, and we couple them in into multi-mode fibers. Uh, and that light then goes into the detector. Um, and once we detect it, we also time, we time, time, time tag the signals using the FPGA. We do this at a rate of 100 megahertz. And so after, after the time tag and the FPGA saves the data to an SD card, we then transfer that data to a, um, uh, to a computer, and then we proceed to do sifting. However, because both of our controllers are running on separate, uh, you know, the FPGA on the transmitter and the receiver are running on separate crystal oscillators, there's actually, uh, they're not synchronous. And so our data is also asynchronous. So that means that if, you know, when your data is asynchronous, you're not gonna be able to do sifting. And we're doing this so fast that there, you know, there, there's big offsets in our data sometimes. And so to do this, we use a novel approach uh, to overcome this issue. It's called qubit-based synchronization. And there's a paper about it by one of my colleagues. Um, at OSU, and by doing this approach, we're actually able to synchronize the data and, and do our sifting correctly. Um, and so now, essentially, I've covered the transmitter and I've covered the receiver. Uh, however, nothing would be possible if we can't point these two uh, optical benches to each other. Now, imagine you know this is done at 10 meters, and imagine trying to align you know moving platforms to a 105 micron fiber on the other side. It's a very difficult task. Um, and what we do is we have two, uh, essentially two control loops to do this. One of the loops gives us coarse adjustments in our setup. Um, that essentially gets the benches kind of pointing at each other um, pretty well, but not necessarily very good. Um, and uh, the other loop, which is a fine adjustment loop, which we call the inner loop, um, actually gives us uh, a much better uh, coupling efficiency once uh, we are close enough to uh, uh, each other. So the way this works, and I'm going to describe only uh, tip, just one side of this, but essentially both uh, drones have both an IR beacon and an IR camera. The IR camera takes a picture of the, op of the opposite IR beacon. That image is then sent to a Raspberry Pi and is processed, and we calculate the, the center of this white blob right here. Um, and then what we do is we have a PAD controller, so we calculate the error, and with the PAD controller, we send a signal to this gimbal. Uh, which then is able to uh, correct, try to correct, it's able to correct for the error. And so these gimbals are actually pretty nice. Um, what we, uh, they are usually, they're professional grade of gimbals and they're used in like high end movies uh, to carry cameras and they are able to point at, you know, whatever they want pretty accurately. Um, and what we do is we put our optical loads on, on these gimbals and that's how we kind of get the course adjustment and get them pointing at each other pretty relatively well. Uh, and the performance of this gimbal is, is, is about uh, 0 0.025 uh, degrees, and we do this at 50 hertz, and this is to one sigma. Um, and so um, now moving on, um, now that we're kind of in the ballpark of where we need to be, we need to do a little bit better in the alignment. And the way we do this is by using the inner loop. And the inner loop, the way it works is we have two co-propagating beams, one at 705 nanometers and another one at 520. Um, so I'll show you this here. So the 705 starts here and the 520 starts on this side. So there are two loops running in this case. I will go over one. So essentially we send a beam uh, from the 705 nanometer laser. It reflects off a dichroic mirror. Then it reflects off of two fast steering mirrors, uh, which we control using piezoelectric motors. Um, then the signal is, goes through free space. It bounces off two separate, uh, of two other, from two, uh, off of two other uh, fast steering mirrors on the receiver. It then uh, reflects off of uh, another dichroic mirror, passes through a, uh, a focusing lens, and finally makes it to a position sensitive diode. And what we do here is that, uh, you know, the position sensitive diode um, is connected to a Raspberry Pi, and there's a lot of electronics going on, including an analog to digital converter. Um, and so we calculate the position and error, again, using a, a PID controller. And that PID controller then sends signals to the uh, to the fast steering mirrors telling it that, you know, what kind of adjustments you need to make in order for us to have the beam pointing, uh, you know, into the quantum channel relatively well. And so this control loop gives us a better performance and this gives us about 0.001 degrees um, at 800 Hertz. 
And actually, it turns out that both of these control loops are pretty, are pretty good, and we're able to actually have a pretty good uh, coupling efficiency in the air. And so just to show you some of the results of these loops, uh, you can see this is actually data taken on the ground. You can see that when the loops are off, they we're actually not coupling anything into our setup. As soon as the outer loop turns in, this is the course adjustments, uh, you can see that we start to couple in uh, some of the signal. And finally, when both the outer loop and the, and the inner loop are on, you can see that not only do we get a better coupling efficiency, but also it's very stable. And that's very good for us. We want that in our setup. And so in the air, it's a little bit choppier, uh, but you can see that when they, both of them are off, um, there's no signal coupled in. As soon as the outer loop turns on, there's more signal going in, but it's very choppy. Um, and then when both loops are on, um, the, there's more coupling, but the signal is still a little bit choppy. And in this case, uh, we were able to achieve an average of 30% coupling efficiency onto our benches. So this is actually good, good enough for our experiment. Um, however, um, you know, and, and because it's good enough, we actually just went ahead and took some data. Now you know the setup, right? We have all the control loops that point, that make the benches point at each other, and we have uh, all of the quantum uh, setup uh, also uh, good to go. So we collected some data, and that's and what you see here um, is actually um, let me explain this plot a little bit. On the y-axis, uh, what you see is the time differences between uh, consecutive hits on the detector, um, and so. The way we send data is we send it in batches. There's batches of you know, signal, signal regions and there is uh, no signal regions. And so in the no signal regions, you get a lot of these, uh, well, you get a lot of dark counts in our detector. And those dark counts will register you know, as, as bigger time differences because our, our signal uh, rate is much higher than the, than the dark count uh, rate. And so you can see that over here, we have a first dark count region and then we have some signal um, the, uh, region over here. And you can see that it's a little bit choppy over here. Um, this is in the air. Um, and then we get to another uh, dark on region, and then you can start to see another region of signal here. Um, and so we were actually able to synchronize uh, effectively on this data. And we were able to achieve a quantum bit error rate of 7.7% in, in horizontal vertical bases, and 8.7% in, in the left and right bases. And so this is well below the require uh, the uh, require eleven percent for a non-zero uh, key rate, um, and uh, and so this is very good for us. But but we think we can do better. Um, you know, we we can still you know, for example, get rid of these uh, dropout regions, um, and so that's what we're going to do next. And actually, um, you know, we want to we are working on trying to reduce these dropout regions in our quantum channel. And also, we want to improve our coupling efficiency. Um, we are going to do this by getting a better, um, you know, we're switching our fast steering mirrors that control, or sorry, the piezo motors that control the fast steering mirrors in, an, in our inner loop. And we're also switching our analog to digital converter uh, to get a higher sampling rate and a, and a higher uh, um, resolution in our system. We think that this is going to do the job and we're going to get much better data. Um, we also need to do privacy amplification. Uh, Namely, we need to collect enough data to overcome the finite key uh, problems. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're in collaboration with uh, actually Norbert Luckenhaus at Waterloo. Um, and we're trying, we, we did some preliminary estimates uh, to see, you know, how long we need to fly to collect enough data. And it turns out that we, we can do collect enough data given our Cuber uh, within two five, uh, two five minute flights. And this, this is very good for us. Um, we also need to improve our inner loop performance we, because we want to do this at longer distances. Um, you know, 10 meters is fine, but we want to, you know, it, to, we want to improve our distances. And finally, we want to try this in different platforms, not just drone to drone. We want to try this on, for example, you know, drone to moving car or something like that. Um, and those are our immediate goals, and we think we're per very close to getting this done. And finally, I'd just like to thank my, the, our collaborators at the University of Illinois. Um, and my collaborator at OSU, Roddy Cochran, um, my advisor, Dan Gauthier, and Paul Quiet uh, at UIUC. Um, and also, finally, thank my, uh, you know, our uh, 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 funding agencies for all of their contributions. And if you have any questions, I'll take them now. Thank, thank you. Very much.